<clears throat> we are live, I think. Okay, guys, I'm just going to get Charlie in the room. Yay! Wow, that was messy. Uh, I hate technology. <laughs> um, if you're just if you're just tuning in, um, if you're just tuning in because we popped up on live. This is a conversation all about Mont Blanc and um, our experience and why it's a great mountain to climb for your first time. If you're tuning in over from Facebook, we apologise for wasting 17 minutes of your life while we were unable to connect. Um, but we have gone to the trusted Instagram, which seems to have worked for us. So um, thanks for your patience. We, we, we won't keep rambling. We'll get straight into it. So um, hi to everybody out there. Please feel free to comment as we, as we start talking about the, um, our Mont Blanc adventure um, that we're hoping goes ahead this year. But um, um, we run here at Adventure Base. Um, so uh, say hi, ask any questions that you might have. We'll try and answer them as we go through. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, um, video, you will have a better insight into what the trip entails, some of the, some of the little snippets from our own experience of climbing the mountain, um, and just a, an overall um, better viewpoint of um, how the trip goes. So, um, why don't you start, Ollie, with a quick introduction to who we are and what we do, and then we'll get straight into some of the facts about the mountain itself. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining everyone. can see we have 18 or 19 people here with us. Big crowd. Um, so, yeah, we are Adventure Base, myself, Ollie, and Charlie. Um, we, we run the day-to-day -day here and we operate guided trips all over the world. But today we're going to talk about Mont Blanc, um, which is in our backyard. We're, we're based in Chamonix, France, and um, we can't see the summit today. It's a bit cloudy, but hey-ho. So yeah, we just want to talk to you a little bit about Mont Blanc and the package that we offer and the experiences that we've had and the experiences that hopefully you or some of you will have joining us this summer and um, and beyond so it's been it's been one of our first it was one of the first products that, that that we sold so we've been doing it since 2008 and when um guy willett and kenton cool founded the founded the company back then so we've 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 probably taken thousands of people up and down the mountain safely now so we've refined the itinerary we refined the trip and um we think we've got it to a point that gives you the maximum chances of summiting, but also um, gives you an all round great experience. And, and just going back to one of the original points we said at the very beginning, this trip itself is a great trip for those who are looking for either a mountaineering adventure or whether they're looking to start um, uh, experiencing more mountaineering um, based trips and they want to start down that journey so it's a really good starting point for high mountain high mountain stuff um, so Ollie as you tend to build most of these trips you're you're definitely more detail orientated why don't you give us a few facts about the mountain itself I better get these right <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, as, as I'm sure most of you might know already, Mont Blanc is the highest peak in, in the Alps. Uh, standing tall, we believe, at 4,810 metres. Um, Mont Blanc is on the border between France and Italy. So we're, we're on the French side. Um, we were talking about this earlier, Charlie, that there's still a bit of a debate who quite owns the top top. But um, at the moment, France seems to have got their... So, um, yeah, uh, amazing mountain, the highest peak in the Alps, the highest peak in, in Western Europe. Um, and the, a little bit about the history. I mean, it was first climbed, I think, in 1782 by two local, local Chamonards. Um, and, um, yeah, there's, there's um, a sort of typical way to do it is from, from the Chamonix side over, 
over a kind of a week long itinerary that that we'll dive into a bit later on. Yeah, yeah, correct. You 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 touched on the dispute um, between France and Italy about who owns the actual top bit. I, I, <laughs> We, we, we were discussing this earlier this week and, and actually I had no idea there was, um, the conversation was still going on. You think in 2021 that they just draw a line down the middle, but apparently not. There's still, um, there's still discussion as to who, who actually owns the top bit. Um, but some other interesting facts, one of my heroes, Kylian Journet, um, has the world record for, for getting to the top of Mont Blanc and back down again. Um, uh, starting in Chamonix, so there's a church in Chamonix where a lot of a lot of challenges start from, and he did that in under five hours, um, which is when we run through and the steps you need to take to actually get to the top of Mont Blanc is mind blowing. Um, so um, well worth looking at uh, googling that and trying to find some documentaries on it because it is a phenomenal effort to run this to run to the top of Mont Blanc and down in five hours. Yeah. I mean, guys, don't don't worry. We're not gonna we're not gonna try and make you do the same as as Killian. Um, he's a he's definitely one of a kind. Although Charlie reckons he's pretty close. Yeah, um, five days. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just just before we get into some more of the details of the trip, Ollie, I said at the beginning, Ollie and I have both climbed the mountain, um, and some we've we've both attempted attempted it at different times. I summited in 2013 with a Welshman called Vernon. Um, he was in his early 60s at the time and um, we had an absolute blast going up Mont Blanc. It's, uh, it's, it's, one, of those, it's one of those trips where age doesn't really matter. Um, and it's not, about how, it's not about how quickly you go. It's about going at a consistent, constant pace. Um, and Vernon is the king of holding a pace and not deviating from it. Um, so that was an, an amazing experience for me. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit more as we go through the itinerary. But Ollie, you've, you've tried to climb Mont Blanc and have climbed Mont Blanc three times? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, I've, been, on the, I've been on the mountain three times. I summited my first attempt in 2015. I was very lucky. Um, super lucky with the weather with, with the conditions everything um and then the last two times were slightly more tricky i tried i tried on skis in 2017 um but unfortunately the weather um the one thing we can't control uh the weather didn't let us let us get right to the top so um and then most recently i tried again last last summer 2020 with a friend ben um and I, I, I didn't really prepare properly. We'll, we'll touch on it, how important it is to, <laughs> to acclimatize. Um, and basically don't do what Ollie did. Um, I, I didn't acclimatize well enough and I felt the effects of the, of the attitude at the, at the second heart. So we didn't, again, we didn't quite make it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you have to agree, don't you, Charlie? It's, you, you can't underestimate Mont Blanc. It's, I think it's important to say that it's a, it's, it's a, obviously a big mountain, a big challenge, a big undertaking, and it is definitely doable for people with you know, as a first peak because we because of the way we we run the trip, um, we teach a lot of the the necessary skills and make sure everyone's acclimatized and stuff. But it's yeah, it's it's not to be underestimated. For sure. No, it's not. And and whenever you take on these 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 big expeditions or or big big trips in in high mountain in environments it you there has there has to be a focus and um you have to approach it seriously it is a um it's not something everybody does and there are dangers involved in it um we, we try and mitigate those as much as possible but it's 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 important to remember the power and also how to some extent how um more and and useless you can be if you put yourself in a position where um, you can you can get in trouble. So we take all the necessary steps to um, mitigate those. As I said, whether it's guides, whether it's itineraries, whether it's enough acclimatization days, Ollie. Um, 
to, to put you in a position where it's safe, you're likely to summit and you have a good experience because no one wants to get to the top but feel feeling horrible. So um, all those elements we put together into our Mont Blanc trip. So um, rather than us rambling on about our experiences, Oli, why don't you just talk us through the itinerary and we'll go day by day and explain a little bit more about why we do what we do on those days. Yeah, so um, the way we do it is we, we run a, a week-long trip um, because we feel that by trying to rush it in just two or three or four days, you just won't have the success rate um, that, you, that we would like to give you guys. Um, so you'd typically arrive on a Sunday um, and the Sunday evening we have a, a meeting together. You'd meet myself and Charlie and, and your guides uh, for the week. Um, we'll be staying in a lovely mountain lodge in Chamonix. Um, have a have a nice briefing all together. Run through the kit, run through the plan for the week, and make sure everyone's kind of um, on board. I mean, it can be quite a daunting mm. experience, right? I mean, a lot of people who join these trips are travelling on their own. Yeah. You know, you might have had this dream to climb Mont Blanc for years, and now it's finally happening. You've arrived. You can see peak from the window you know it's it's like right it's go time so it's quite a special moment everyone's sort of coming together and meeting each other everyone's on the same journey um and i think i think it's in just talking from my own experience i didn't have when i climbed Mont Blanc, i didn't have any mountaineering experience you, at that point you 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 feel underprepared because it's one of those experiences until you take on the 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 trip you don't know what you need. So you can read as much as you want, you can Google as much as you want, but you really need to go through it um, or go through some sort, uh, form of mountaineering to fully understand the processes and, and what it feels like. And, but everyone's in the same boat. So there are no stupid questions. Um, yeah. and, and we try and encourage people to ask whatever they want at that point, because we've both been there. We, we understand the nerves. Um, and... Um, and we've heard everything, right? So you can't ask us a silly question. And um, you also um, don't worry if you're nervous. If, if you weren't nervous, then perhaps you've, you, you need, you've, you've either done lots of mountaineering before or um, you're like Alex Honnold from Free Solo. And you just don't have that in your brain. Um, so I, mean, I always say to people when they, when they arrive, you know, and quite often people do say, you know, I ask, how are you feeling? Are you excited? Oh, I'm a bit nervous. That comes up a lot. And I'm like, good. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're nervous because that yeah. means you do something pretty special. Like, you you know, there's always nerves before something, yeah, you know, quite Ex big. Like exactly. this life, you know, super nervous before that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so especially when it go well. <laughs> um, okay, so day one, day one, uh, I've rocked up. Um, I've sat down with my guide. I've, I've met my guide for the first time and uh, um, often with us, it's a chap called Fabio. A lot of you uh, who are part of our community and who've climbed with us before will know Fabio. Um, great, great chat. Um, some yeah. great. We have a bunch of amazing, amazing guides and um, yeah. yeah, we're super, super pro. I mean, we call them our friends, right? You know, they're mm. all friends of ours now. They've been working for us for years and um yeah, really happy for them to be your guides on these trips. And you, so you met the guide, you, you, you've met Ollie and I, um, actually completely unimportant at that point, because um, you're the guides. Sorry, <laughs> funny how the interest in, in me and you just dwindles straight away as <laughs> walks in. Yeah, exactly, it's like a rock star. And you've met the other you're climbing with, who are a huge part of, 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 of the trip. And like Ollie says, a lot of those people are on their own. They've done it. This is their first time. So you, you're often in, in, in good company. So um, we run through everything. Everyone goes to bed. Day two, what happens? Uh, yes, yeah, so day two, we drive. So Chamonix is on the border of, of Italy. And mm -hmm. the, for the next few days is to go and train and acclimatize and climb a peak called Gran Paradiso. Um, beautiful mountain in Italy. Uh, standing at 4,061 meters. I hope I got that right. Um, so another 4,000 are in the bag for, for those of you that are interested. Um, so on that day, we will drive 
through the Mont Blanc tunnel into Italy and then walk up to the hut. It takes about three hours. Um, a nice leisurely pace to start the week off. And then we arrive at the hut and check in to our dorm room and um, we'll have some lunch and then we'll head outside onto the glacier and, and familiarise ourselves with the equipment that we're going to be using. So for some of you, it might be the first time um, using crampons, using an ice axe, wearing a harness, wearing that, it all in a combination. Um, so with the guides, with the team, you'll all run through how to use all of that equipment and, and start to pick up little nuggets that you'll find useful for the rest of the week. Um, then that evening we'll have a lovely dinner in the in the, in the refuge in the mountain hut, and um, try and fall asleep relatively early because it'll be an early start the following day. Um, easier said than done. But then the following day the alarm goes probably quite early, three, four, maybe five in the morning. Um, just before you get into day three, Ollie, just to go back to day two. Yeah, uh, it's um. I just wanted to quickly explain my experience, which is it's the, when you get to that refuge, it's it's fucked on top of a, a mountain before Grand Paradiso, or it's on the build up to, to actually climbing Grand Paradiso. And it's, you can see the top, so you can see where you're going, but you've also climbed for three hours already. And you're in this, you're in, a, it's almost like you're surrounded, you're, you're atop, you're atop a, a flat plateau and you've got mountains all around you. And it's really humbling. Right. You kind of, again, you're away from the hustle and bustle and buses and cars and whatever else. <clears throat> and this, you're just a hut and a mountain. And again, that's a really nice experience um, in itself. Right. You've got you've got the nerves beforehand. You've just you've been wearing your B2 or your B3 boots, which are heavier than usual. You're wearing what kit you've got to have tomorrow. You, yeah. You've spent the first day talking to clients and you kind of have this rest moment before or calm before this you do your the your first storm if you like and it's um it's a pretty spe I, I thought for me it was a pretty special place mm. oh definitely i mean all, all of the mountain huts are, are real special spots and like you said there's you're kind of away from from all the noise and mm. there is some phone signal but not much you know so phones tend to get pushed further away and you know at the dinner table there's no no one has their phone out you know you're all chatting and playing cards and it's just a really nice nice experience to get away from it all up there um and yes yeah, so i hope then you try and get a bit of sleep um a bit of italian wine might help with that and then wake up nice and early head torch on equipment on onto the glacier um and it will all feel a bit you know, it's still dark, you're half asleep, you're, you're roped up with the people in front and behind you with the guide leading the way. Um, and it can feel kind of quite surreal, you know, like, wow, it's really happening. We're going, we're going to, our, to climb the first peak of, of many, many people's, you know, careers. It's the, it's the first one. Um, and then sun, you know, sunrises, spectacular. If you're lucky, the guide will stop and let you take a couple of pictures. Um, and then make your way up to the summit. So in total, it's probably six, seven, maybe eight hour day. So pretty. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty high up. Like it's not a. Day, not isn't easy. it? But you, yeah, you're covering quite a lot in that in that first period. So you, you're you you're walking on a glacier with your crampons, probably for the first time. Um, you are roped up, potentially for the first time. Um, you're going over crevasses for the first time which is exciting i mean they are crevasses are are beautiful um uh, mm -hmm. and off an element of of danger but don't worry your guides know the glaciers very well so um you, you're never in any danger and, and grand paradiso itself we don't want to give too much away but you you, you kind of get to the top of the snowy bit and then you've got a rocky outcrop which of which you've got to navigate and traverse which is um which is exciting in itself so um you kind of feel pumped. You feel like a mountaineer once you get to the top of that summit before you start coming down again. And it's a, it's a great place to start. Yeah, I mean the the summit is is quite exposed for, you know, for some of us, and you really feel like you've achieved something great on that on that day because you've 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 reached the summit of a four thousand meter peak, 
Um, you've picked up a bunch of skills along the way. Um, as a team, you're summiting together. It's just a really nice moment of camaraderie. Um, and then you'll make your way down back to the hut for um, a well-deserved lunch and a bit of a rest. Uh, some some group might then leave and head back to Chamonix. We, we quite like to stay there for an extra night. Um, the reason being the hut is at is is above 2000 meters i think it's about 27 so an extra night of sleeping at altitude helps dramatically with them um, with acclimatizing so we think it's a really worthwhile to stay a second night there um, yeah and we think you know the purpose of your trip is to climb mont blanc is to summit mont blanc so the more we can the the greater we can weight those chances in your favor um the more we will do to achieve that and one of, and as ollie says giving you an extra night at altitude if people do suffer from altitude sickness that gives people a um, um an extra opportunity to try and acclimatize yeah day four um this, so then next day we wake up pretty pretty normal time we'll, we'll drive back to chamonix via our favorite ice cream parlor <laughs> can't give you any more info on that we're just gonna have to join one of the trips yeah right uh, and then we'll be heading back to Chamonix, back to base, back to our mountain lodge. And um, it's really, it's really just an afternoon to, um, yeah, th run back what you've just experienced and check your equipment. You might have figured out a few things about what you brought or what you didn't bring, which you might want for Mont Blanc. Essentially, Grand Paradiso is a bit of a test run. It's a bit of a test run. Um, to see what works, what doesn't work, for then for you to be then well prepared to to climb Mont Blanc. So in the afternoon, there's plenty of time to switch out your kit for something else if it didn't fit properly, or you know pick up some extra snacks for the for the following day. Um, once you once you've rested, you've you've had a you've had a good shower and you've you've had some good food and you're rested. We're moving to day five. I think we're on now, which is the beginning of the push for, for, for the summit of Mont Blanc. Yeah. So day five, six and seven are, are reserved for Mont Blanc. Um, the way we, the way we normally do it is we try and approach the first hut on day five. Um, so again, it's about a three hour hike. Um, we do take a cable car and a, and an old style mountain train to give us a little bit of a head start. Um, <clears throat> so from the, from the end of the train, we, we hike three hours to the first hut. And um, again, a bit like at Grand Parody, so at the beginning of the week, we check into the hut and we'll, we'll have, a, have a lunch and then run through some bits in the afternoon and just make sure we're all up to speed. Um, one thing to note, I don't think we mentioned, is the, the guiding ratio in, on Grand Paradiso is is one guide for four four climbers, um, whereas on Mont Blanc it's one guide for two climbers. So most likely you'll just be with one guide because most of our groups are capped at four people. Sometimes there's a few more, um, but so you'll be you have this Grand Paradiso experience with one guide, and then a second guide will most likely join for the Mont Blanc climb. So an, another new face and some new stories. Um, is always quite exciting. Um, so, yeah, at that point on day five at the Tete Russe hut, the first hut on the on Mont Blanc, we will divide up the team, however the guides feel is best suited for everyone to to get the best out of the summit. So, you'll be split into teams, but although you're in, although you're now into two teams of two, you're still a team of six altogether with the guides. So. Um, it's not like you suddenly go off in different directions and sit at different tables. You're, you know, you're the adventure-based team going up that week and you're all together. Um, and people can switch if necessary and all that type of stuff. But, um, and, and it's often based on natural pace. So as I was saying at the beginning, it doesn't really matter what pace you go at um, as, long as, you, as long as you keep moving. So um, mm. what, what you don't want to do is push too hard to try and get there too quickly and then be in a spot of bother when you're coming down because you've, you've you've used all your energy it is very much about going slow and steady um and and let's not forget you are at altitude here so 
that that plays a big part and you notice it once you start getting um once you start getting higher up in the mountain you do notice that and your body can't recover as quickly you can't push as hard as you want to um and therefore the pace has to drop the pace has to drop anyway but the the pairings we do look to try and match you up to um um your equivalent pace setter yeah yeah exactly that and and like the night before the grand paradiso summit the night before the mont blanc summit is is again probably full of a few nerves and, and things like that but ideally you can try and sleep a little bit um i think the first time i went i i think i was lucky if i got 30 minutes um yeah in a in a way it doesn't matter because you know what you have to do right and you can do people no sleep um so then day six of the mont blanc trip um is is kind of the the main summit day um we would typically get up quite early um i think when i we got up at 1 a.m this it does a little bit on the weather on the conditions um, and things like that but in general you can expect quite an early start um, so the first couple of hours will be in the dark um, we'll cross the, the Grand Couloir and make our way up the ridge line towards the second hut on Mont Blanc so the, the Goutte hut um, and usually by that point the sun has risen and you get this amazing sunrise view across the Chamonix Valley and the, and the Alpine peaks in the distance. Um, we'll, we'll just pop our head into the Goutte hut and, and perhaps drop off a few bits um, that we don't need for the rest of the summit push. Try and lighten the load a little bit. Um, quick refresh, not too long, a bit like a pit stop. Um, and then we'll keep going and push on to the summit. So in total it's it's a it's a massive day it's a really yeah, it's, good, it's 10 12 you know 10 12 hours moving on your feet um yeah. but like charlie um it's not you're not sprinting you know you're not like pushing at max output you're just you just you're trucking along you know you just keep yeah. you keep going it's just it's just it's about endurance and and just Get to the top and and like we said getting to the top is only halfway um you'll then return back to the higher hut so the gute hut and that's kind of it for the day um but what i like about what i liked about the route is we get a lot of questions about the grand couloir and rockfall down um down that part of the of the trip one of the reasons we leave at one in the morning is to is because that's because it's at its coldest you're less likely to have rocks fall down um during that period um it, on in the occasional times it does um but um th there's there's little sections on that day that are quite exciting right you've got the grand couloir which is exciting in itself and then you've got you're climbing up the ridge itself to get to um um to get to the Goutte hut and then you've got the sections going going towards the top of Mont Blanc so it's broken up into nice little chunks and the terrain changes and and the views change depending on exactly where you are and it's um it's it's very surreal I, I was before this call we were talking about it um and one of my lasting memories was I wasn't quite at the top yet and I was trudging along with Vernon and listening to his stories because he's he's well she's got some great stories um and you look across France and, and part of Switzerland and the shadow of Mont Blanc is just covers such a wide, mm. a wide area. And you think this, mm. this mountain affects this region so drastically. Um, and you feel so humbled. You feel so small in, in that moment. Mm. And in many ways, it's, it, it's, it's sometimes what we're after. It's nice to be humbled again. <clears throat> it's nice to be, it's nice to kind of step back and think, crikey, we are so tiny in this. We all get wrapped up in all the details of our lives and, and think everything's such a big deal and how important it is. And you go into something like Mont Blanc and stand at the top and look across and think, crikey, I'm so tiny in this whole world and just yeah. on this. Um, but yeah, I, I just remember seeing that, tri that triangle shadow across the rest of France and thinking, wow, that's, uh, that's quite incredible. 
it's also it's also nice looking down at the Chamonix Valley itself. Well, I guess every the amount of people that are just fast asleep. Um, you know, uh, and I'm on the top of Mont Blanc. Yeah, no idea what you're up to. You, yeah, you've been hiking for two three hours. Um, uh, and it's yeah. usually at that point once you get up, you're an hour in walking down. You start thinking about all the nice food you're going to have when you get to the bottom. And it's like. <laughs> If, any, if anyone does any running or, or cycling events or any sort of endurance events, I, I, for me, I start thinking to the food I'm going to have, and it's never healthy. It's never an apple or a banana. It's never. A burger never. or a plate of chips. I, I'm, I'm almost thinking about that as soon as I leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A loco burger I'm going to order when we get back down. And a shower. Yeah. Crikey, that, that's always a... So this is the, we've, we've, we've been to the summit, we've walked back down. Um, we're now at the higher hut, the Gute hut. And um, this, it's kind of just time to rest. People will have a nap. Um, you usually get into the hut about midday or one o'clock, maybe two o'clock. Uh, and then dinner is served at six. So it's a bit of time to just rest. You usually just wake up, eat dinner, go back to bed. Um, and then the following day, day seven, is time to go down. So, um, <laughs> we've got a sorry to interrupt. So we've just got a couple of questions that'd be nice to answer now before we get to the end of the trip. Um, Anna Anna Nichols has asked, "How long might you spend at the summit, and how many other groups might there be?" Yeah, good question. Thanks, Anna. Um, it really depends. It's hard to say. I mean, typically there is enough time to hang around and take photos and soak in, soak in the view in the moment. Um, it does depend a bit on the weather. Um, for example, if it's super windy, the summit is, is obviously very exposed at the top there. So um, it really depends, but we'll, we'll try and spend as much time there as possible. I remember the, the first time I, I was up there, we had perfect weather no wind it was warm we spent half an hour up there on the summit um you know we ate our sandwich and some snacks and took photos and just took our time so equally you could be up there and you there might it might be completely cloudy and and you might not see anything so you might not stay there for much much longer than a couple of minutes um and that kind of depends with with the with the other groups of course it's a popular mountain but it's so big it's so vast that people are really spread out. Um, people also leave at different times from both huts. So it's not like everyone is going from one place to the summit and back down. Um, people leave from, from both of the huts. So it's, it's really spread out. There'll, there'll be a couple of groups up there, most likely. Um, but we've had plenty of times when we've been the only ones on the summit. Um, so, yeah, it's not... It's not like how you see some of those horror photos. Um, Mont Blanc isn't. It's not like that. Hmm. Um, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron House has asked who is joining us on a um, Everest base camp trip soon. Um, so we're going to convince him to do Mont Blanc as well after that. He said, do we get burger and chips on the summit? <laughs> for a, a extortionate supplementary price. Yes, we can arrange for that. Um, but it's probably going to have to be dropped by helicopter from the Italian side. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, it, I don't think you, at that point, you don't, yeah, burger and chips. Probably. It's it, Aaron, it'll taste better when you're back down. Trust me. <laughs> um, oh, we've got a load of questions coming in now. Let's, um, let's just jump on them. Yeah. Uh, I can't even pronounce that. So, uh, Koei, Koei Low World. Uh, what's the typical weight one carries going up and down Mont Blanc? <clears throat> yeah, good question. Ollie? Yeah, uh, ooh, that is a good question. Um, uh, not much, somewhere between five to 10 kilos, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah around, around, I always say around the 10 kg. It depends if you're a light or a, or a heavy packer. I, mm. And Ollie, we, we kind of we're different on this i i pack a lot <laughs> i like my snacks i like to have lots of i like to be prepared for for everything so my pack's heavier than ollie's whereas you carry quite a light pack so um you streamline your your mountain experiences so you know it, it depends i mean in general we recommend uh, a backpack around 30 liters 
30, 35 liters. So, and usually the bags are pretty full. So in, in general, what, you, what, what would you have? We can maybe just quickly describe. You, you're actually wearing most of it. Um, mm. The heavy stuff. So the heavy stuff are the boots, which you're obviously wearing. The crampons are heavy, but you're wearing those on your feet. The ice axe is relatively heavy, but that's in your hand. So in your backpack, um, you've got water, probably a litre and a half, maybe mm -hmm. two spare layers, camera, um, and, and to be honest, not much else. So, yeah, it's, it, it's never really been a problem about carrying too much weight, I think. No, but also, if you, want to, if you want really good brownie points, the guides carry ropes, and when you're on the glaciers, um, mm. you're obviously roped up, so you're all kind of carrying it, but when you get back down off the glacier, they take the rope off, and the guide often wraps it around, and the ropes are quite heavy, um, mm. and the guides do this every week for the whole summer, or they're, they're, in the summer, they're climbing all sorts of mountains, so if you want brownie points, then ask to carry the rope off the guide once you're off the glacier, and um, they'll make sure they look after you. <laughs> uh question in here can it be skied can it be skied yes it can martin um it's actually being skied at the moment so the the time for for ski descents is around april may um and yeah it's it's people are skiing perhaps not today because it's very cloudy but i've i've seen some ski tracks from the from the window the last few days um, you also don't you don't ski down the same route you climb you climb up so it's a don't expect <laughs> in the summer skiers to be bombing past you when you're on, on your way up it's a it's a different route um, and maybe a trip we'll do in the future um, yeah. but anyway uh, moving moving on sticking with the itinerary uh, so we've we uh, is it day six we're sleeping at the Gute hut and then day seven we're heading back down um, the mountain to Chamonix. Yeah, correct. Sorry, just right. again reading. That's... Really, that's, that's really nice. We totally recommend the trip. I did and had the best experience ever. Yeah, you smashed it. Um, Aaron's back to work, so yeah, we'll see you soon. Um, um, where were we? So day seven, you come back to Chamonix, mission accomplished. Um, come back in the early afternoon, time to have a shower and check back into the lodge and um, and yeah, kind of just it all sort of will soak in, I guess, at what you've what you've what you've achieved. So there's always plenty of time the last evening to go out and have celebratory cold ones and a nice meal together. Um, that's the, that's the bit we, me and Charlie, really enjoy popping our head in and. And hear how you all get on and, and the stories and yeah it's a really nice moment i think at the end of the week where we're all together and um have one last night together before you all before you all leave the next day i read i read a quote somewhere and i'm going to get it wrong now so um when better to do it than when you're on live um on a live video but it was something along the the lines of a story is only worth a story is only a story when you can share it and it's so true that every group comes down with a different story you know, and um, their own experiences and somebody drops something or someone, someone said something or there's, there's a uniqueness to every trip, even though it's the same trip. Um, and that's because of the, um, uh, the people that are on these trips. And a huge part of that for us are the guides and the, the, the people that we work with and, and, and we, we, um, we trust your experience with. Um, and we've spent, and Ollie's spent an awfully long time making sure that these, um, these are the right type of people, not just from, a, from an experience point of view, but also from, a, from a, a, a character point of view. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about some of our people, the guides who, who, who take these guys on the trip? Yeah, I mean, what else? What else to add? They, they, they've all been working for us for for a number of years, and um, we we think there's a lot more value in in just taking someone to the summit and back down, and kind of being done with it. We like our guides to add a lot extra 
and then sort of become part of the team, become part of the family with with the with all of our clients and and us and everyone. Um, so I mean, they're all vastly experienced. Some of the stuff that they've done is, you know, we could only we could only dream to mm. see some of the mountains that they've climbed. So. Um, yeah, we're really happy with our team. We've got, I would say, probably a handful of about 10, maybe eight to 10 high mountain guides um, that we sort of work with on these trips. Um, and yeah, we we can't wait for you. I mean, many of you have obviously already met with them and climbed with them. And one thing I, I quite like noticing is how how often people will join a trip with a particular guide and then come back and book another trip and, and really ask for that, ask for the same guy because they've built such a relationship on the first trip. And and in a way you can kind of see them as a mentor, like um, it's probably quite a strong word, but the, the more trips you do, you you can really, you can learn so much from these guys. And um, yeah, the more, the more trips you do, if you, if you do it with the same guy, I mean, equally you can do it with different guys, you have a sort of different experience, but one guide can really take you on a journey over a number of years and you really build a nice relationship. So. Yeah. And the thing I, I admire about the guides is they, they live for the mountains. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, ex they're extremely well qualified in technical ability and understanding and, um, and all the qualifications they need to, to be in the position they are. But to become a guide, it's a very long process and you have to spend a lot of time in the mountains. So you have to love it. And these guys and, and, and girls love the mountains and they pick up these, again, things you can't read about or, or uh, Google. They pick up just by being, they know when the weather's going to shift. They know what snow is unstable. They know they can sense when things are going to happen. And it's, <laughs> it's magic watching them because you're so, we're so, you're so focused on your kit or what you're doing they're taking it all in um, and they're able to, to compute all these different factors that, that help with providing um, a great trip and a great experience. So like Ollie says, now I, I, th I think mentor is a really good word because you do, you learn so much, especially on that first trip um, from these guides and then subsequent trips afterwards. And, um, and they've all got great stories. I mean, they have, they have, they have lived amazing lives and they have been in amazing situations and you can just you can sit in those huts and listen to them all evening talk about some of their adventures and experiences and um, and and uh, yeah they're just they're uh, they're very very interesting people um, yeah for sure yeah yeah in a very they you know they genuinely care and they want to improve you as a mountaineer um, that's the element for me that's very important. Um, you know, not simply just going up to the summit and back, but teaching you a lot of things on the way, taking you under their wing um, and just, you know, spitting you out at the end of the week with all this new knowledge and, and skills. So I just saw a question come in uh, from Kate, Kate Whitehouse. So what boots would you recommend to wear? Is it best to take two pairs, one for the lower sections plus the B3s? Um, what, did, uh, what did you do when you went up? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a I'm a two boot kind of guy. Um, I wore my trail shoes or hiking shoes up to um, up to the refuges, and then I switch into B two or B three boots depending on on what I'm using. Um, it it doesn't really matter. You can do either if you if you're happy in B two B three, then you can trek in them as well. Um, it means you're carrying less weight because you don't have another pair of shoes. But um, I quite like being agile on my feet where possible. So, yeah, I am. Um, that's my that's my approach. What's yours? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I think. I think on on the the one thing you don't want to get is blisters. Um, so I guess there's two ways. If you own if you own your boots and you've been wearing them for a while, you know you might be happy to hike in them throughout the week. But if you're renting, like a lot of people do. Um, it's quite nice to wear your trail shoes or trainers up to the hut and then stick the boots on for the for the summit. Yeah. Um, just quickly, Mark, just want to 
Mark Thomas, we also can't wait to have you come out with us this year and climb Mont Blanc. Whiskey and Jaffa cake sounds like an interesting combination. <laughs> uh, you can talk us through it um, when, when you get out here. Um, okay, so look, we've, we, we've touched on the itinerary, we've touched on the people. Um, why, don't we, why don't you, just a lot of the time we get asked about accommodation and the refuges, what are they like? There's a, there's a, there's a huge um, scope of what people think the refugees, refugees are gonna be like. So some information on that would be great. Yeah, so um, in total during the Mont Blanc week, we stay in three, typically in three different refuges along the week. So at the beginning of the week, we stay in the, in a, in the refuge called Shabbat in the, on Grand Paradiso. Um, and then we stay on the Tet Roos hut and then the Gute hut. They're all fairly similar. Mountain huts in general are quite basic. Um, but we all kind of have a different understanding of what that means. I, well, both of us really like them. They're, they're quirky. They're usually on a mountainside with amazing views. Um, food is served. So breakfast, lunches, dinners is all, is all cooked for you by the, the staff in the, in the huts. Um, sleeping arrangement is usually in small dormitories. Um, and usually that would be with a group that, that you're in. So um, kind of like a hostel in a way. Um, but to be honest, you don't need much more than what they provide. Um, it's, it's a bed to sleep. It's food in your belly. Um, and the key is the location. You know, without those huts, we couldn't, it wouldn't be possible. Um, to yeah, make this it'd be getting very cold in a tent. So. Yeah. Uh, and we have... We have a really, really nice base in Chamonix, um, a mountain lodge, super cozy, super comfortable, nice twin rooms. Um, again, food available, uh, in-house bar, a nice outdoor seating space. And it's right at the foot of Mont Blanc, so you can literally just see it from your window. Um, and that's quite a welcome, uh, a welcome break of the mountain huts in a way, because you, you know, a nice clean bed with um, mm. a bit more privacy than, than in a hut. Um, okay, we, we've been we've been rambling on enough now, so we'll we'll, we'll we've probably got another five or ten minutes, um, unless you've got lots of questions. Um, Kate, I'll get onto your question in just a second. It's a good one. We could probably do a whole live video on gloves and and, and what gloves you need. But d just before we go through some of the questions that were sent to us beforehand and questions that people are asking, um, just to summarise, the, the Mont Blanc trip that that we have built out over the years is. Um, it's a great opportunity for those who are uh, looking to get into engineering um, because that's, that's what they would like to do more of or anyone who's just looking for a mountain adventure. We built it so that um, you can come with no experience with a basic level of fitness um, and you can learn in the first few days technique, um, skills, equipment and you, you, you can become acclimatized and then the back half of the week is all about the objective which is summiting Mont Blanc. Uh, we even, I don't know if Ollie mentioned, but we throw in an extra day where if the weather's bad, you can, um, we can tweak the itinerary so we can, we can move things around and, and we do an extra summiting, um, an extra summiting day window. Um, but it is very much an experience for, for, for anyone who wants to give it a, wants to give it a go. And having both done it ourselves, Ollie's done it a few more times than I have, it's an amazing experience and you learn so much doing it. Um, and um, we, we all come away with our stories and, and new relationships. Vernon and I were, were, were messaging yesterday and this is when we climbed back in 2013. Um, and actually he's, come, he's gonna come out in the winter to, to Chamonix and we're gonna catch up for a bit. So it's more than just climbing the mountain, it's the relationships and stories you build off the back of it. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Ollie. I think you nailed it. <laughs> That's it. My waffle and Ollie of um Ollie likes to condense things and, and remind me. Um, yeah, um we I think we covered it pretty well. I mean, for those joining just now, I'm sure you can watch back and yeah, we've basically just been talking about our Mont Blanc trip and how and how we're covering every base to make make it as uh, to give you the best chance of, of making the summit basically. Right. Um 
But we, we have some questions, don't we, Chaz? Uh, we do. Um, why don't we do Kate? Because she's, she's in the group now and she, she might be waiting for it, just with regards to the gloves. Um, would you also recommend finger gloves or will mitts be okay? Ah, oh, Kate, you're giving me a hard time. Um, to be honest, it totally depends. And I know it's probably not the answer you're looking for, but some people naturally get very cold fingers and toes and noses and, you know, with dexterity. So um, if you're one of those people, mitts sort of does give you a bit of extra warmth, I believe. But at the same time, you are carrying um, walking poles in your hands and a potential ice axe as well. So it's quite nice to have movement in your fingers. And sometimes I find personally that mitts can be a bit, um, a little bit restrictive. Um, but the key is just that they're warm enough. You can have warm enough finger gloves and you can have warm enough mitts these days. So the key is really warm enough, yeah. And on the flip side of that, Kate, I use mitts because I get cold fingers. So I, I sacrifice dexterity for, for, for warmth. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, they talk about a three layer system in gloves, don't they? You know, a super lightweight, a, a midweight, and then a heavyweight. Um, but you're absolutely right, is the right question. When it comes to mountaineering, you've got to look after your hands. Um, soldiers, they say, look, look after your feet. Well, in mountaineering, you've got to look after your hands and you don't want to, you, you can't afford to have cold hands. So, um, yeah, whatever it is, make sure it's warm. Um, if you do have any questions, just just ping them through in the in the comments box at the bottom, and we'll we'll try. We had people send some in beforehand, which we're going to rattle through now. Some of which we've already covered, so um, we won't go through those. Um, Aaron House, who I think's already dropped off, uh, but he asked, "Can I climb this without being experienced in mountaineering?" Um, yeah, in short, yes, you can absolutely. Um, and the reason is because we teach you a lot at the beginning of the week and you need, you need to come into it. If you, if you don't have any mountaineering experience whatsoever, um, you need to come into it with, with a really good level of fitness um, and just the hunger to learn, uh, the desire to learn skills. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, but at the same time, it is a very, it's a very new sensation to walk into crampons for the first time, for example, on ice. It feels very you know, it feels very different. Um, so yeah, in short, yes, you can, but be prepared to have your learning hat on and, um, and soak in a lot of information at the beginning of the week. Always, Ollie. We're always wearing our learning hats, aren't we? Um, Joel Evans, how high is Mont Blanc in bananas? Um, well, we had this one before, so we, <laughs> we did work it out. Based on an eight inch banana, with a, a mid-range banana, um, yeah, you would need 24, just over 24,000 bananas, um, mm. which is the height of Mont Blanc. So great question. I'm sure that will come in handy. Yeah, um, <laughs> when, when our groups come out. Um, um, just, just quickly, I, I can see Jackie has just commented um, she had zero experience, zero mountaineering experience until she met us. Uh, and um, Jackie climbed Mont Blanc with us a while back and picked up loads of skills and now she has this burning passion for ice climbing um, and she's off ice climbing all over the world it's really amazing amazing to see good, good to see you with us Jackie um, hope you're well um, uh, a couple of other questions in, in the comments section what's the cost of the trip um, it's 2470 euros um, at the moment. So what's that about 2000 if you're from the UK 2100 200 pounds. Um, that includes everything other than flights um, and travel to Chamonix and personal insurance. Um, there's a couple of meals you'll have to pay for here as well. Um, but that everything else is included. Um, uh, Karen or Karen uh, Tattersfield. Um, it's back to the to the rucksack. Um, what sort of weight rucksack would you be looking at to climb and train with? So I, I think Ollie and I would say 10 kilo, five to 10 kilograms is a good weight to train with. As to what literage of backpack, the, the two separate points and often one that um, people ask, 
I, I'm a mid thirties kind of guy. What's what what sort of literature are you at, Ollie? Yeah, just on the nail thirty. Um, it's it's. I find the bigger the backpack you have, the more stuff you want to put in it. Um, but in general, for for training and stuff, yeah, ten ten kgs is good. Um, and you can you can put some bottles bottles of water in there or something like that. But as we touched on earlier, when you do go to the summit, the bag is not actually that heavy because you're wearing most of your your kit. Um, just see another. We should do a separate one just on rucksacks. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, st I think it's Steve, Steve three N um, roll. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. It, what you don't, what you, what I do when I'm doing it, I, I have a 35 liter backpack, so it's rel it's on the bigger side. Um, but I wouldn't try and put them in. You, you, you put them over, depending on what your rucksack is. You put them over the top, and then put the top of your rucksack over the um, laces. So you your boots are on the outside but they're still attached to the backpack again i didn't know before i did the trip for the first Stephen. all right thanks Stephen. um i didn't know that before i did the trip for the first time and it was something that fabio the guide showed me um and it, they were super secure and you know again it's all these things you pick up once you actually do these types of trips so yeah i hope that helps got it nice um what are the questions have we got? Uh, what, which months are best to climb? Um, so typically on, on foot, we, we run trips between June and September. It's kind of the, the, the best climbing window. Uh, it's when the mountain huts are open and it's also when um, the conditions are generally best for, for climbing. So it's quite a big window. Um, we've got trips running every week. Um, departing on a Sunday and sometimes on a Wednesday as well between June and, and late September um, and if you do want to do it on skis you would do it slightly earlier in, in April and May yep okay um, Speedy Tim which I think is Tim Speed we we're talking today how tricky are the crevasses you mentioned um, well you, 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 you're not climbing up and down them or, or directly over them as you might see on on um, videos of people in in Everest um, or climbing Everest you're you're traversing around them so they're not they're not tricky crevasses are just something you've got to be aware of um, and you're but you're that's what your guides there for um, so um, they are they are stunning and they are beautiful um, but you also need to be careful and and often crevasses appear in the same spots they were year after year. So um, guides are familiar with the route and they and they know where to, um, and they know where to to navigate through them. Yeah. Um, Ross, what would you guys recommend for preparation for the trip in terms of training in the UK? Yeah, really good question about training. What sort of exercises, um, but also a recommendation for hikes, climbs that would potentially benefit for Mont Blanc? Yeah, really good question. Um, I'll, I'll take the first bit if that's all right, Ollie, and then perhaps you can jump on the second bit. Um, we are on the website, on sorry, on, on the Mont Blanc page on our website, we've got a readiness test. So it's not particularly scientific, but if you, if you go on the page, you can find it. It's a link through, and it just takes you through a series of 15 questions, and it'll let you know how prepared you are for Mont Blanc. Um, it, so it gives you a rough guide, but specifically around fitness, you, the fitter you are, the more you're going to enjoy it, or the the the, the more enjoyment you are likely to have. Um, you don't have to be a superstar triathlete, and um, you don't um, have to come from a from years worth of training, um, but you do need to be comfortable with long durations of time on your feet so whether that's trekking with a backpack um whether that is longish runs um the more comfortable you are with being on your feet over time the more you're going to enjoy this trip um it, how fit you are and how you function at altitude aren't um aren't 
that they're not necessarily aligned. So you could be the fittest person in the world, but you might struggle with altitude and likewise the, the other way around. But, mm. but what everybody will go through is the need to be able to recover after doing Grand, Pan Grand Paradiso. Um, so, uh, and, and the need to be able to get up to Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc and back down again with a backpack. So lots of, lots of walks, lo lots of treks, um, strength exercise uh, is, are very important as well. So squats, lunges, um, core work, um, get your runs in if you can, um, but don't overcook it because <laughs> the last thing you want to do is come to uh, come to Chamonix uh, with an injury because that's uh, that's certainly not going to help. Um, as for recommendations of hikes and climbs, Ollie, have you got any? Well, none in particular, but I think the key is just to, like you said, to put the time in and do the mileage. So the key really is the endurance side of it so if you can get out to snowdonia or or further up north to the peaks and the lakes or scotland then and do some try and link a few peaks together and and try and get to the stage where you're quite comfortable doing you know thousand plus meter days um on mont blanc the summit day you do i think it's close to 1700 meters of, of ascent so it's quite it's quite a lot um, so I think rather than looking for anything specific, I think in general, the skills can be just learned along the way. Um, but it's more of just working on your endurance and trying to get those multi, a couple of multi, multi peaks in um, and try, you know, set off quite early, come back quite late. Um, and if you can do that well, then you're well on your way, I think. Um, Stephen's asked about walking poles. Um, you can have two or one, doesn't really matter. Um, you, you'll find that as you get closer to the summit, you might have ice axe in one hand and walking pole in the other. Um, so what's quite key is that your walking poles, that you bring two for the trip, um, but if they're foldable, um, that's really beneficial because you can stash one away and use your ice axe in one hand and pole in the other. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very important poles. Don't want to invest in them that is something that we we rent out so we 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 can help with that um just a couple of questions that were sent in before and then we'll wrap it up in in a couple of minutes so if you if there is anyone else out there who's got questions just just please ping them through um can it be done in a weekend in the summer um ollie based on your experience i'll i'll let you answer that one um i mean yes it can um, but you need to be prepared for it. So um, at the beginning of the chat, I, I touched on my experience last year um, where I tried to rush it a little bit with a friend. I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't acclimatized correctly. So I, I struggled with the altitude above the Gute hut. Um, so in short, we wouldn't really recommend, you know, arriving, going the next day, you know, say arriving on a Friday, going on a Saturday, summiting, coming back on a Sunday, um, it's too rushed. Um, and the chances of making it to the summit are very, I would say, very low. Um, so in short, you can do it, be, be our guest, but I promise you, you will not enjoy it. Um, um, you will not enjoy it by, by trying to do that over a, over a short weekend. It's just, you really need to put the time into acclimatise to train to, to make sure you can get there. Um, there are superhumans of this world who, who might be able to do it, and, but the average man and woman, um, like, like my experience last summer, you know, it's, you really need to prepare properly. So come for the whole week, plus you get to climb Grand Paradiso and that's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a pretty impressive, it's a pretty impressive mountain. Um, okay, fine. Why don't we, why don't we wrap it up now? I think we've, I think we've gone on long enough. Um, look, if anyone does have any questions, I know I'm, when, when you take on one of these challenges, there's always a, a ton of questions you think of at a later date. Please just, just ping it across to Wally and I, um, uh, like we said earlier on, there isn't a, a silly question. We've heard them all. Um, and it is a big undertaking, so we want to make sure you feel prepared. Um, we do still have availability for this year um, in August and September. Um, we're obviously hoping things with COVID allow people to, to, 
travel internationally, but like all of us, we're just watching that very closely. Um, and we're already starting to take bookings for 2022. So um, if this is on your list, then we think it's a really nice place to start from a mountaineering point of view. And it's just a great experience full stop, even if it's not the mountaineering route you want to go down. Um, but get in touch, uh, give us a call, drop us a, a message on this. Um, whatever you want to do, um, we'd love to. We'd love to chat to you further about it. But we hope you found this semi-useful and and not too boring. Well, the the number of people viewing has stayed quite similar. So um, yeah, we'll take so thanks that. For all, thanks for all your questions. Um, it's been really fun to interact like this. I think we should probably do it again. Uh, do it again soon perhaps talk about one of our other trips um but yeah that's kind of it from from us right charlie so uh absolutely yeah we'll see you on the mountain soon thanks guys speak soon